Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is still morning, so <laughs> my name is Dana ellis Hunnis. I am a registered dietitian at UCLA Medical Center covering the cardiac floors and some of the surgical floors. I'm also an adjunct assistant professor at the Fielding School of Public Health here at UCLA, where I teach a course on nutrition and chronic disease, and I also cover topics of environment, climate change, and sustainability. So today, I will be talking about healthy eating around the holidays why leaning towards a plant-based diet is good for you and your family and Earth. <laughs> so uh, just to begin, uh, you can ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat, or you can comment on Facebook. So our goals for today are to discuss the importance of healthy eating, why it's particularly important around the holidays, things we can do to eat and stay healthy around the holidays, including diet, exercise, meditation. I will discuss some environmental impacts of our diets. I will provide sample meal planning ideas and I'll troubleshoot your biggest questions and fears. To begin with, I'm gonna talk about the importance of healthy eating in general. Nationally, nearly 38% of adults are obese. That's about four in 10 people. And as you can see, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and West Virginia have the highest rates of obesity. There are more than 35% of people in those states are obese. And California is a handful of states that have about 20% or more obesity. So as you can see, the rates have been going up over time. And as I mentioned, obesity rates among women are now at 40.4%, and that's up from about 35% 10 or so years ago. Now among men, those rates have remained stable. And nearly 8% of adults are extremely obese. And by that, I mean their BMI is greater than 40. Now BMI is a representation of weight for height. So the higher the BMI, in general, the greater the obesity. Obesity tends to start at about a BMI of 30. Now, concerning among children is that over the last 30 years, obesity rates have also skyrocketed. So in the last 30 years, among six to 11 year olds, obesity rates have gone from 7% to 17.5%. That is about one in six children. And then among teenagers, the rates have quadrupled from about 5% to 20%. And the scary thing about that is that unfortunately, obese children tend to become obese adults. And again, so just to show you the statistics among women, the rates of obesity are significantly higher than among men. But among the entire population, obesity rates on average are about 38%. So now that I've scared you with a bunch of statistics, I'm going to talk about the importance of healthy eating and why it is that we really need to do it. So the first reason is we want to stay healthy. I mean, we don't want to be in the hospital. Trust me. We want to prevent disease. We want to stay active. And we want to decrease health care costs, which are skyrocketing. The second most important reason is we want to combat obesity and chronic diseases. We want to help mitigate the worst symptoms and morbidities of chronic disease. We want to help reverse chronic disease where possible. And literature does show that we can reverse a lot of chronic diseases with diet. And we want to teach our children to be healthy eaters. And I don't just mean eating a lot, I mean eating lots of healthy foods. As far as chronic diseases are concerned, diet and obesity are closely associated with a number of chronic diseases, including diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, kidney disease and failure, and cancer. And in fact, there's a lot of studies that show that a Western American diet is highly associated with most of these diseases. And finally, another reason for discussing the importance of healthy eating is sustainability and the environment. Now, probably a lot of you don't know, but diet does in fact affect climate change. It has, and the greenhouse gases. Diet affects fresh water use. In fact, 3% of the planet has fresh water. The rest is salt water in our oceans. And of that 3% water, about 70% of that goes to growing our food. And then diet affects land use, from raising animals to growing uh, palm oil and other, other substances. So heading back to the holidays, because I know those are coming up and we all care about that, 
During the holidays, we are more stressed out than usual. I mean, we're with our family, and of course, that's a wonderful time, but it's also a highly emotional time of the year. We have high expectations. We want to have a great time. Unfortunately, a lot of us stress because we don't want to gain weight. A lot of us are always on battling with weight and diet, and so this time of year is full of less than healthy foods available all the time and parties at work, parties at home, and it's just very easy to gain weight this time of year. So that's a lot of stress for a lot of people. So this time of year, you may not lose weight, but the main thing is to try not to gain. And eating a healthy diet can help prevent, prevent that weight gain. And it may help prevent a cardiovascular incident, such as stroke, or a heart attack because those can really be uh, related to stress. The importance of physical activity and meditation this time of year, again, they're always good for our cardiovascular health. They help us relax, they help get the blood moving, and they alleviate stress. They give you quiet time if you need it. Um, and also they burn calories. So that helps, again, to prevent the weight gain. Again, I say that it's very important to remember this time of year it is a challenge to lose weight. The main thing to keep in mind is to try not to gain. So how do we eat a healthy diet around the holidays? Well, and we can do this all the time, really. We can choose mostly plants. We can crowd out the meat. If you have a plate that is filled with vegetables and whole grains and beautiful uh, herbs and spices, you're not gonna even miss the meat, to be quite honest. If you limit sugar and sugary foods, because simply those are mostly empty calories, choose your indulgences carefully. If you have in front of you four or five different options for dessert, you'd be better off choosing one or two and really enjoying those. Eat mindfully, really be in the moment, chew your food, enjoy the flavors. Pack your own wherever possible. I mean, we know that when traveling airports and convenience stores are notorious for having less than healthy food. Keep trigger foods out of sight. Studies show having a candy jar on your desk means you're gonna eat significantly more than if the candy jar is in the other room on someone else's desk. Walk or talk. By that I mean if you're eating, you know, keep your hands busy, walk around with someone, talk around with someone, don't just stand at the table and, and nibble away. Don't mindlessly nibble, same idea, and stay active. That's one of the most important things that we can do this time of year. So why a plant-based diet? There's a few reasons. The first one I'll cover is for your health. It reduces the risk of chronic disease and it's been shown to reduce or reverse a myriad of chronic diseases. There are a bunch of studies out there, again, that demonstrate that eating a plant-based diet can help reverse diabetes, can help reverse cardiovascular disease, and in cultures that eat a mostly plant-based diet, the rates of these diseases are really very low. They're full of vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and phytonutrients. Phytonutrients are nutrients that can only be found in plant foods. Uh, they're full of potassium and magnesium, which are very good for muscle health and heart health. And they're full of fiber, so it helps keep you regular, it helps keep that heart healthy and ticking. And they're low in salt, sugar, and saturated fat, which we all eat far too much of. So a plant-based diet is very good for our health. And when I say a plant-based diet, I mean a whole plant-based diet, where the foods are not processed. They're whole fruits and vegetables, whole grains, things of that nature. So why else is a plant-based diet healthy? It's good for Earth's environmental health. A plant-based diet uses significantly fewer resources. And in fact, you can grow about 5,000 to 10,000 times more calories on one acre of land with a plant-based diet than you can with growing, uh, raising animals. It uses significantly less water. And also plant-based diets have a much lower carbon footprint. They don't really create nearly the methane that uh, animal-based diets do, or the nitrous oxide, or even the carbon dioxide. So just um, to demonstrate what it is exactly that I'm talking about, as we can see from this diagram here, this is from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, 
uh, updated in 2010, they show that 47 percent of all greenhouse gases come from our energy sector. That means fossil fuels and coal, things of that nature. And then about 21 percent right here, that comes from agriculture and land use. Um, and it just shows you that a larger proportion than we think of what our food of our food actually does produce greenhouse gases, more than transportation driving your cars. And even a, a more recent article came out from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences saying that about 25 percent of all greenhouse gases come from agriculture. So that's even higher than this 2010 article. So again, how much carbon, beef and dairy, contribute 80 percent of all agriculturally related greenhouse gases, about 50-50 each. Poultry and eggs are about 10 percent as much carbon as beef and dairy. And then fish and aquaculture, the carbon from that comes from the boats going out and catching the fish, but they may potentially be unsustainable because of overfishing. About a third of fish stocks globally are in fact overfished. And then something else you may not know is that about a third of food in the United States is wasted. It's just tossed into the trash, into landfill, and that is the third largest contributor to greenhouse gases after the United States and China. How much water? Well, it takes about 1,800 gallons of water to make a pound of meat, about 1,000 gallons of water to make a gallon of milk, about 59 gallons of water to produce one egg, and about 1,100 gallons of water to make a pound of poultry. So now when I say a plant-based diet, what do I mean by that? I mean having whole grains, oats, um, other uh, quinoa, starches, things like that, fruit, whole fruits, seeds and nuts, those are wonderful sources of plant-based omega-3 fatty acids, vegetables, definitely four or more servings per day, and then beans and lentils are a wonderful source of protein. Again, the benefits of a plant-based diet, almost anyone can follow this diet, the caveat being certain disease states or certain health states, you know, you should probably speak with a dietitian or your medical provider just to confirm that it is okay for you, but almost anyone can follow this diet. It does in fact support weight loss, as I mentioned. It helps prevent chronic disease. It provides more than adequate protein. And to demonstrate that, your average 150 pound woman only needs about 55 to 60 grams of protein per day and to get that, you could eat half a cup of beans, which is about 10 grams of protein, a few slices of bread at four to five grams of protein each. You could have beans and other legumes. And all of that can add up very quickly to your 55 to 60 grams of protein. And then your average 200 pound man, he only needs about 75 grams of protein per day. So really a lot less than the typical American currently eats. It helps with regularity, again, because of all the fiber. It's good for your health, which I've touched on, and it's also good for Earth's environmental health, which, which I also touched on. Now, in my practice, everyone is always asking me, well, how do I do it? What do I eat for a week? How will I not get hungry? And those are really good questions. Um, and, and the best way to do that is here's an example of a weekly meal plan where you can have you know, whole grain cereals with an alternative milk or nuts, scrambled tofu, non-dairy yogurt with nuts and berries. For lunch, you can have uh, bibimbap. There's even a restaurant here in Westwood that has that. You can have black bean and corn enchiladas. I mean, the, the gamut of foods is just very, very wide. And to help you, here's an example grocery list. And as you can see, almost everything on this list is non-processed. It's full of fiber, it's whole grains, it's fruits and vegetables, and there's just, there's such a wide variety, so much color in the diet. Now, because it's the holidays, I have to give an example of a holiday menu because we all want that beautiful centerpiece in the middle of our, of our table. So as an example of a beautiful centerpiece, you could do a kale and farro or barley stuffed pumpkin or kabacha squash. I know a lot of you are asking, what's a kabacha squash? Well, it kind of looks like a pumpkin, but it's green, but the flesh is very sweet and very flavorful. 
You can have yams and green bean almondine, an eggplant dip, herbed whole wheat stuffing, a vegetable broth soup, roasted cauliflower and grapes, or even better, roasted, um, oh, I just lost the name of what I'm thinking of. Um, well, it's related to cauliflower. Um, Brussels sprouts, there, I knew it would come to me. And grapes, and I know it sounds like a crazy combination, but roasted with a little olive oil, some herbs, uh, pepper, it's absolutely delicious. And then pumpkin pie. And in fact, in my household, just this past weekend, we took some sugar pumpkins, we baked them, we scooped out the flesh, we cooked it, and then we made a beautiful pumpkin pie out of a, a, a whole pumpkin. And again, here's an example of a grocery list in order to make those, those foods. Hopefully that gives you some idea of, of what you won't be missing at your Thanksgiving meal. Um, so again, you know, if you have any questions, please do ask on Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat, or you can comment on Facebook. And um, if you do have any other question, follow questions moving forward, I also have my contact information down at the bottom of this. Now I understand we have some questions. Ah, thank you. Okay. Will I get enough protein if I eat a plant-based diet? So I did cover that a little bit in my presentation, and I mentioned that a 150-pound woman really only needs about 55 to 60 grams of protein per day. Um, and as I also mentioned, there are a lot of plant-based proteins out there, and in fact, some I may have failed to mention are edamame can have 10 to 12 grams of protein per serving. Um, soy milk has seven to eight grams of protein in a serving. So even with breakfast, if you had, for example, whole grain cereal with soy milk, and um, if you had for lunch a sand whole grain sandwich with hummus and all these other fruits and vegetables, you, you can definitely get all the protein you need from this diet. Will I feel full on a plant-based diet? Now that is a very good question. And that brings me back to my point of a whole foods plant-based diet, because if you're eating processed foods, foods that come in a package, foods that don't really have a lot of water to them, then no, you probably won't feel full on a plant-based diet. If you're eating a diet that's filled with the whole grains, the fruits and vegetables, and all of the other natural foods out there, then yes, you should feel full on a plant-based diet. And is it possible you might need to eat an extra time every day? Yes, it is possible. Um, but for those of us who like to eat more than three times a day, that's okay. <laughs> um, are there plant-based ways of getting enough omega-3 oils? Oh, now that is a good question. I am asked this all the time because people are concerned that the only way to get omega-3 oils are from fish oils. And in fact, that is actually not the case. The government, the, the NIH, actually only has recommendations in place for plant-based omega-3 oils, and those are, that's the ALA, um, as opposed to the EPA and the DHA that we get from fish oils. Now, the ALA we can get from flaxseed, we can get that from uh, walnut oil, a handful of walnuts, you really don't need very much, and you will have enough of the omega-3s. And your body can produce the EPA and the DHA from the plant-based oils. So that is a very good question. Uh, what about calcium? How do I get enough calcium if I'm not eating dairy products? So that's actually a, a misconception that we can only really get calcium from, from dairy. We, we can get calcium from many foods, from broccolis, from, from many plants. Uh, we can also get it from fortified soy milks, fortified almond milks, hemp milk. Almost any non-dairy milk out there today is fortified with calcium and vitamin D for that matter. Uh, another question is, what about vitamin B12? I am asked this a lot as well, you know, how do I make sure I'm getting enough vitamin B12? Because vitamin B12 is something typically we can only get from animal products. And if there is a concern for that, you can take a supplement. Um, and also some plant-based items such as uh, nutritional yeast are very high in vitamin B12. And we don't really need very much vitamin B12, it's about 2.4 micrograms per day. So it is definitely possible to uh, get enough B12 from a plant-based diet, and if there is a concern, we can take a supplement or a multivitamin for that. 
And I think that's the last question as of right now. So I just wanted to thank you all very much for tuning in today. And uh, I hope you enjoy your plant-based Thanksgiving and holidays thereafter. Thank you very much.